When it comes to fortune telling, protection is more about ethics than it is about municipal law. If you would like to learn about fairy folklore, delve into modern fairy faith spirituality, and explore fun and fanciful fairy-themed events, please subscribe to Fairy Fortunes for new videos every Friday. Hello, my fair friends. I'm Ruby Ruse, and welcome to Fairy Fortunes. On today's episode, I'd like to continue my series on fortune-telling in the law, this time specifically focusing on fortune-teller ethics. Now, in part two of Fortune Telling in the Law, where I focus on crime, I talk about a specific scam artist, Patricia Johns, who defrauded hundreds of people out of thousands upon thousands of dollars. Now, she was convicted of criminal charges, but only of tax fraud, which left all of her victims without restitution. However, in part one of Fortune Telling in the Law, I talk about the constitutionality of placing restrictions on spiritual practices such as fortune telling. So taking that into consideration, how does a person protect themselves against fortune telling, which like so many other services and practices can come with some inherent risks? And I think really all we can turn to is really looking at the personal code of ethics, maybe not just of the individual fortune tellers, but maybe of ourselves as well. Many people who study the concept of ethics say that the terms morality, ethics, and justice all can somewhat be used interchangeably. I think that the differences are nuanced, but they are, in my opinion, very clear. For me, morality examines the concepts of what is good versus what is evil. Ethics evaluates what is reasonable in the context of a specific set of circumstances. And then justice examines what is fair and strives towards balance and equality of all persons involved. In my opinion, ethics are based on our values, but I think ethics go beyond those attributes that we find valuable. Because ethics, I feel, focus on our relationship to others. Ethics consider the rights other people have in connection to us. Ethics are about our obligations to others. And ethics consider the benefits our actions have upon other people. And I really feel that ethics become that foundation of justice, which helps us examine fairness and try to come to a condition of balance society's laws are really preemptive measures of justice. They are based on those ethics found in consensus in the society. They educate on what that particular society finds will bring the most harmony to most people and establishes a baseline of balance and fairness. I think it's important that individuals examine their own personal code of ethics because it really gives you a framework to identify specific circumstances where what you value and how you evaluate fairness and balance can come into question. And in many points of history, we've seen circumstances where individual code of ethics are in direct conflict with outdated societal laws or laws where balance has been disrupted. So when conducting this research for morality, ethics, and justice as it pertains to fortune tellers, I went to a host of different websites of many different psychics looking for their personal code of ethics. And what I found was it was just as likely for a fortune teller to post their code of ethics as it was for them not to say one word about ethics on their social media or web presence at all. 
So that leads me to ask you, the audience, do you think that fortune tellers should post their personal code of ethics? And if you do think so, what are some values and attributes that you think are important for a fortune teller to consider when compiling their personal code of ethics? Please let me know in the comments down below. I don't necessarily think that not having a code of ethics posted on their website is necessarily an indication of a red flag for a fortune teller. There are two tarot readers that I've interacted with frequently that I think are completely legitimate and charging reasonable fees and can provide very good and accurate services. And neither of them has a code of ethics posted on any of their platforms. I do think a code of ethics can show a potential client what that particular fortune teller sees as reasonable and it gives you some information on on some circumstances that might come up in your readings. Now in part two of Fortune Telling in the Law where I focus on crime, I use the story of Patricia Johns to really articulate how unlikely it is for victims of fortune telling scams to receive any kind of restitution or justice for what happened to them. And it really opens up the question of should there be some kind of regulation to prevent this kind of fraud? There are two organizations that do offer certifications for psychics. One is the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. And then there was another organization called the American Association of Certified Psychics. Of the two, the National Spiritualist Association of Churches I find to be the more reputable. You can go to their main website and it will clearly delineate the criteria that their certified psychics, mediums, and healers have to go through in order to receive that certification. Not only do they have to take a certain number of course hours, they also have something akin to an internship program where they have to attend spiritualist church services and provide mediumship and healing and psychic information during those sessions. So when a person receives a certificate from the National Spiritualist Association of Churches, they have gone through a battery of criteria. Bunny bomb! You have to keep in mind that the Spiritualist Association of Churches is very much a Christian organization. That in and of itself is not necessarily bad, but if you're coming from a pagan mindset, it's not necessarily going to correlate for you. The spiritualists really don't seem to believe in things like reincarnation and magic, so if that is a topic that you want to explore, the National Spiritualist Association of Churches and their psychics, mediums, and healers may not be the right place for you. Now when it comes to the National Association of Certified Psychics, I have a lot more concerns. Unlike the National Spiritualist Association of Churches, there is nothing on their website that tells you the criteria for that certification. It doesn't answer the question, what makes your psychic certified? To me, not knowing the criteria really makes a certification a moot point. Secondly though, when I went to their contact page to try to connect with a human that could give me more information, I was given an error message and that for me is a huge red flag. So I can't in good conscience really recommend the American Association of Certified Psychics. It, it just seems like it's leaving the door open for more fraudulent scams. I was able to find a code of ethics associated with the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. And then I also looked at individual codes of ethics from various fortune tellers that I found on the internet. And I noticed a lot of consistency in those documents. I appreciated that a lot of those code of ethics talked about finances and fees right away. 
I also really liked that many of these individual code of ethics had a reoccurring theme of empowering people to make their own choices. That they really delineated that a fortune teller is not meant to be a crutch, they're just a finite tool to use for certain circumstances. So I thought that was really interesting and I thought that articulated a more spiritual value and attribute. These codes also included reoccurring themes of respect and responsibility and it also brought in that notion of ethics being about the relationship to other people. It's important for a fortune teller to respect a client's privacy, for example. It's important that the fortune teller understands that they have a responsibility to the client. Honesty was another important theme. Remember that ethics are about establishing certain circumstances where balance and equality come into question. And in fortune telling, there are circumstances where what's in the reading may not be exactly what the client wants to hear. They may be hoping for an entirely different outcome and the fortune teller may or may not know which outcome they're truly hoping for. For example, if somebody comes to a fortune teller to ask about whether purchasing a certain piece of property is going to be a good thing for them, the cars might say, yes, go ahead and purchase that property, which seems like a wonderful thing, an uplifting thing, but for the person asking that question, maybe they're asking that question because they really want the fortune teller to tell them, no, don't buy it. There's really not necessarily a way to know what the client is hoping for. So talking about honesty in particular circumstances I think is very valuable in a code of ethics regarding fortune telling. And most of these codes of ethics included a clause about there being no guarantees. It's kind of like talking about there being no hidden fees. They're articulating to a potential client what that client can expect from the fortune teller. So they're very much setting the ground and clarifying circumstances where balance and equality are called into question. And it's even better, I think, when the fortune teller kind of explains what a guarantee means for them. I think that these fortune tellers that are very concerned about ethics are really trying to show that they are a safe person and to some extent that alone is admirable. They're trying to show that you can trust them. There's still the risk that you can't. Maybe they're trying to get you to trust them so that they can take advantage of you. It's hard to say, but everything that we do in life is based on risk. And I think that's where as a client, a client really has to consider what they think is valuable and what they think is ethical before they take a risk on the services coming from another person. There was an interesting situation that came up doing research regarding ethics. I actually came across a person who purported to be a professional fortune teller who believed that what they were doing was entirely an act and that they had no magical powers at all. And they stated very clearly that they did not believe in magic. They didn't believe in divine communication. They, <laughs> they thought it was all essentially bullshit. <laughs> I appreciated this person's honesty and it, to some extent when people ask me about fortune telling, I do leave the door open. I explain that it very well may be that I, that I am doing more mentalist actions where I'm evaluating your emotional reactions as they appear on your face. Maybe I'm looking at your body language. I, I leave the door open for that, but that said, I don't close the door on a more existential and spiritual conception of fortune telling. I believe that divination is connected to a higher power, if you will, that it is a way to 
communicate with divine energy, whatever that means for a person. I do think that divination and fortune telling can in fact connect us with the beloved dead and helpful spirits that want us to grow and evolve and become the better versions of ourselves. So while I do leave the door open for more mundane and scientific explanations of fortune telling, I'm not sure that I personally would feel comfortable being given a reading by a fortune teller who doesn't believe that there is that possible spiritual connection. I want more from fortune telling. I want it to be more than a fantasy. And I think that's okay. As long as you look at it as a art form meant to inspire you and take you to a place of evolution and growth. But I've said many times on this channel that other forms of art can often do the same things that fortune telling can do. If you haven't already watched part one and part two of Fortune Telling in the Law, I have provided a link to the playlist down below. And in that description box as well is a link to some resources that I used to make this video for you. But I do have to tell you that the resource list for Fortune Telling and the Law was so vast that I surpassed the character limit on the description box. So what I did instead is I wrote a blog article on my website that provides all of those sources to you and you can find that link down below in the resources. Please stay tuned for part four of Fortune Telling and the Law where I will be presenting signs and red flags of scammers posing as fortune tellers, psychics, and mediums. And until that video is available, you may also enjoy my video on fairy morality is not about good and evil, seven fairy values. And with that, my fair friends, have a magical day. Yes, my Crowley cat. Do you want to be in the video? Do you want to sit on my lap? No. You just want attention? You just want attention. You don't want my heart. <laughs> You're kind of distracting me. Yes, you are. You're really hurting me, honey. <laughs> you are. How about I do this? I will put the blanket on my arm so you can need make biscuits on the blanket. How's that? You want to make biscuits on the blanket? Okay. <laughs> Love you. Yes. But you're so pokey.